When the quest began to make cars safer, no one had a clear idea how to do it. Little was known about the effects of an impact on the human body, what the driver could withstand. To find out, a seemingly lunatic experiment was carried out in the New Mexico desert by the US Air Force in 1954. Scientist John Stapp strapped himself onto a rocket sled to boldly go where no man had gone before. He started the countdown. 10, 9, Adrenaline eight, comes in and the heart begins to beat five, a little faster. Four, then uh, just as he reaches zero, you get this enormous ram against your back and uh, feel totally helpless. You're being given the biggest kick that could be delivered. Stapp had been propelled at a speed of 632 miles per hour and stopped in 1.4 seconds. No one has ever undergone such a test before or since. I couldn't see anything and I was looking around and I was beginning to think about seeing eye dogs and white canes. And I was thinking to myself, now I've paid my dues. I've gotten there. I've shown them what they want to know. And from now on, life is going to be good. John Stapp had tested the limits of human endurance and shown that, properly strapped in, a driver could survive almost unimaginable forces. 6,000 miles away, Swedish engineers were going to work on an egg and were coming up with the same answer. The three-point seat belt introduced by Volvo in 1959. Volvo patented the device but allowed everyone else to use it free of charge. Inside the car without belts, we all tumbled about like popcorn. The first seat belts were accompanied by a huge publicity campaign. The adverts were chilling, the crashes were spectacular. They had no effect whatsoever. Well, really, almost nobody I know <laughs> wears seatbelts. That, that's the truth. I find it uh, inconvenient. I don't see where you need them, really, you know, to drive carefully. I don't like to feel so tied down. Mostly they're a pain in the neck. <laughs> The horror on the roads would not go away. In 1967, the British government acted. A bill to make the wearing of seat belts compulsory. There was an outcry, the start of a 16-year battle, the biggest safety issue of the 20th century. Many regarded it as an invasion of their rights. Any intrusion into civil liberties was not going to be condoned by the, by the people. Uh, these were things to be guarded. Uh, perhaps in those early days there was a feeling of, uh, damn you, I'll go to the devil my own way. I am master of my own uh, destiny. If I uh, don't want to wear a seatbelt and get flung out of my car and killed, that's my responsibility. Go on blowing, sister. All the propaganda was to no avail. The casualties continued to pour in, with no end in sight. Nine times the law came before Parliament. Nine times it was thrown out. In the hospital emergency wards, the situation was grim. I can well remember a young child who travelled in the front seat of a parent's car early one evening to go and buy uh, something for supper, the English dish of fish and chips, and there was a collision, local street, low traffic speed and so forth, but a collision sufficient to throw her through the windscreen of that car because seat belts were not uh, in vogue in those days. She was brought here, had instantly lost the sight of both eyes and it was unsavable. The trauma for that child was huge and it would affect her for the whole of her life. Britain's motorists felt someone was taking a liberty. 
And that someone was a woman. To have a woman come along and tell them they must wear a seatbelt was intolerable. I used to get uh, angry, almost life-threatening letters from uh, indignant men who deeply resented having a woman minister of transport, particularly as that woman did not drive herself. They were having a love affair with their cars, weren't they? And the bigger and more beautiful, the better. This was the new great release, the great opportunity, the great purchase that young men uh, were going to make. Uh, they, they wanted to be free. They didn't want a lot of rules and regulations. It was certainly not proposed by a woman, that's for sure. Barbara Castle, damn it. A woman impinging upon the, the motor car and the motor car business. Oh dear, that wasn't a good thing. In the end, children were the key. Mm. No one could bear scenes like these, of children injured and suffering. So when a law was proposed forcing children to be strapped in, even the most die-hard opponents couldn't say no. When it was shown to have saved lives, the opposition crumbled. In 1983, wearing a seatbelt became compulsory for everyone in Britain. Straight away, road deaths fell by a quarter. It was to be the most successful safety device ever invented. Nag yourself to remember this drill. Clunk the car door and click the seatbelt. Clunk, click, every trip. The British may have been conquered, but Americans were to prove a much tougher proposition. Only one in 20 of them bothered to wear a seatbelt. Millions were spent trying to persuade them, all to no avail. What's the first thing that goes through your mind and head on if you're not wearing a safety belt? The steering wheel. All in favor of wearing safety belts, raise your hand. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. But then, miraculously, the problem was solved. A wonderful new device, the airbag. For Americans, this was the ultimate panacea. No longer would it matter if a driver wore his seatbelt or not. The bag would save him regardless. Early tests envisaged the new wonder bag on the front bumpers of cars, even in aeroplanes. There seemed no limit to the places where one could appear. By the early 70s, the first car manufacturer was ready. This is a 1973 Chevrolet. It's the world's first production airbag car made by General Motors. It has an airbag for the driver and an airbag for the right front passenger as well. If we had had these kind of airbags all these years, this last quarter of a century, all of the cars you see around us in this wrecking yard most of those drivers and passengers in the front seat would have walked away instead of being killed or horribly injured. But Chevrolet abandoned their airbag one year later, claiming that the customers didn't want it. When the American government proposed making the bags compulsory, the industry fought tooth and nail. It would be the last great safety battle of the 20th century.